Dracula by Bram Stoker. Chapter Five Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra. Ninth of May. My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you, and by the sea, where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I have been working very hard lately, because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies, and I have been practising shorthand very assiduously. When we are married I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and if I can stenograph well enough I can take down what he wants to say in this way, and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practising very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sundays squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day if there is anything in it worth sharing but it really is an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists doing, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that, with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on or that one hears said during a day. However, we shall see. I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well, and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all of his news. It must be nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we—I mean Jonathan and I—shall ever see them together. Oh, there is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Good-bye. Your loving, Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumours, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a great deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mamma get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent parti, being handsome, well-off, and of good birth. He is a doctor, and really clever. Just fancy! He is only nine-and-twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself he has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study, and gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you have never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There, it is all out, Mina. We have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together, and eaten together, and laughed and cried together. And now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him! I love him! There, that does me good. I wish I were with you, dear. 
sitting by the fire undressing as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop, for I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. L. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. May 24th. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains but it pours. How true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September, and yet I never had a proposal till today, not a real proposal, and today I had three. Just fancy! Three proposals in one day! Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three proposals! But for goodness' sake don't tell any of the girls, or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas, and imagining themselves injured and slighted if in their very first day at home they did not get six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina, dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three, but you must keep it a secret, dear, from every one except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything. Don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man, with the strong jaw and the good for it. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things, and remembered them, but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool, and then when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry he said he was a brute and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off, and asked if I could love him in time, and when I shook my head his hands trembled, and then with some hesitation he asked me if I cared already for any one else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt a sort of duty to tell him that there was some one. I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice and all that sort of thing. But it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow, whom you know loves you honestly, going away and looking all broken-hearted, and to know that, no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He is such a nice fellow, an American from Texas, and he looks so young and so fresh that it seems almost impossible that he has been to so many places and has such adventures. I sympathize with poor Desdemona when she had such a stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't, for there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any, and yet— My dear, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. 
No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I, helping him all I could, I am not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, he never does so to strangers or before them, for he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I am afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it, as I have never heard him use any as yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me, and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his, and said ever so sweetly, "'Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixins of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me, and let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humoured and so jolly, that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said, as lightly as I could, that I did not know anything of hitching, and that I wasn't broken to harness at all yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner, and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so, on so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it, that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always, and never earnest, because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped, and said with a sort of manly fervour, that I could have loved him for if I had been free. "'Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know. I should not be here speaking to you as I am now if I did not believe you clean grit, right through to the very depths of your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there any one else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears, I am afraid, my dear. You will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one, and I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men, or as many as want her, and save all this trouble? But this is heresy, and I must not say it. I am glad to say that though I was crying, I was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes, and I told him out straight, Yes, there is some one I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine, I think I put them into his, and said in a hearty way, "'That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he'd better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more selfish, anyhow. My dear, I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and kingdom come.' Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like, for that other good fellow, or you could not love him hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Mina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble, too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he's so sad, so I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I am afraid I was blushing very much, he said, "'Little girl?' I hold your hand, and you've kissed me, and if these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and good-bye." He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear, or a quiver, or a pause, and I am crying like a baby. Oh, why must a man like that be made unhappy, when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on? I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me, 
and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once, after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving, Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending to me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Good-bye. Dr. Seward's Diary Kept in Phonograph 25 May Ebb tide in appetite today. Cannot eat. Cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it, there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seemed to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patience, as I would the mouth of hell. Memorandum. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia Rome venalia sunt. Hell has its price. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards, accurately, so I had better commence to do so, therefore. R. M. Rinfield, age fifty-nine, sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea, which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish a possibly dangerous man probably dangerous if unselfish in selfish men caution is as secure an armour for their foes as for themselves what i think on this point is when self is the fixed point the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal when duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident, or a series of accidents, can balance it. Letter Quincy P. Morris to Honorable Arthur Holmwood, 25th of May My dear Art, We've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas, and drunk healths at the shores of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup, and to drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made, and best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome, and a loving greeting, and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep into a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours? As ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris, 26 May. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. Art. End of 
Chapter Five. Dracula, by Bram Stoker, Chapter Six, Mina Murray's Journal. Twenty fourth July, Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley, which broadens out as it comes near the harbour. A great viaduct runs across, with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you are on the high land on either side, you look right across it, unless you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red-roofed, and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scene of part of Marmion, where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin, of immense size, and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This, to my mind, is the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town, and has a full view of the harbour, and all up the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbour, that part of the bank has fallen away, and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them, through the churchyard, and people go and sit there all day long looking at the beautiful view, and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee, and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day but sit here and talk. The harbour lies below me, with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea-wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea-wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end, too, has a lighthouse. Between the two piers there is a narrow opening into the harbour, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water but when the tide is out it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the Esk, running between banks of sand, with rocks here and there. Outside the harbour on this side there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy, with a bell, which swings in bad weather, and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here, that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man. He must be awfully old, for his face is gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very sceptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said, very brusquely, I wouldn't fash myself about them, miss. Them things be all wore out. Mind, I don't say they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating cured herons and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet would creed out. I wonder, myself, who'd be bothering telling lies to them, even the newspapers, which is full of fool talk." I thought he would be a good person to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale-fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin, when the clock struck six, whereupon he laboured to get up, and said, "'I must gang again words home now, miss. My granddaughter doesn't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready for it takes me time to cramel aboon the grease, for there be a many of em, and miss I lack belly-timber sairly by the clock." He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town to the church. There are hundreds of them—I do not know how many—and they wind up in a delicate curve. 
The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. I think they must originally have had something to do with the Abbey. I shall go home, too." Lucy went out, visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. 1st August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend, and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything, and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them, and then takes his silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful colour since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it, and put it all down. It be all fool talk, lock, stock, and barrel. That's what it be, and nought else. These buns, and wafts, and bogusts, and barguests, and bogles, and all anent them, is only fit to set bairns and dizzy women a belderin. They be nought but air blebs. They and all grims and signs and warrens be all invented by persons and illsome burke bodies and railway touters to skeer and scunner halflings and to get folks to do something that they don't other incline to. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that not content with printing lies and paper and preaching them out of pulpits does want to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here, all round you, and what air you wilt. All them steens, holding up their heads as well as they can out of their pride, is a cant, simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies wrote on them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory, wrote on all of them. And yet in nigh half of them there bain't no bodies at all, and the memories of them bain't care to pinch a snuff about, much less sacred. Lies, all of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog! But it'll be a quare scroderment at the day of judgment, when they come tumbling up in their death sarks, all jooped together and trying to drag their tomb steams with them to prove how good they was, some of them trimlin and ditherin with their hands that dozened and slippery from lying in the sea, that they can't even keep their girp o' them." I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air, and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies, that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins! There may be a poorish few not wrong, savin where they make out the people too good, for there be folk that do think a balm bowl be like the sea, if only it be their own. The whole thing be only lies. Now look you here. You come here a stranger, and you see this Kirkgarth. I nodded, for I thought it better to assent though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on, "'And you con say that all these steens be aboon folk that hapt be here, snod and snog?' I assented again. "'Then that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay bed that be tomb as old Dunn's back a box on Friday night.' He nudged one of his companions, and they all laughed. "'And my gog!' How could they be otherwise? Look at that one, the after sabaft the beer bank, read it. I went over and read Edward Spencelag, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres, April, eighteen fifty four, age thirty. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to hap him here? Murdered off the coast of Andres, and you consated his body lay under. Why, I could name ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above," he pointed northwards, "'or where the currents may have drifted them. There be the steens round ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, lost in the lively off Greenland in twenty. Or Andrew Woodhouse, drowned in the same seas in 1777. Or John Paxton, drowned off Cape Farewell a year later. Or old John Rawlings whose grandfather sailed with me, drowned in the Gulf of Finland in fifty. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to Whitby when the trumpet sounds? I have meanderums about it. 
I tell ye that when they got here they'd be jumlin and jostlin one another in the way that it'd be out like a fight on the ice in the old days, when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark, and tryin to tie up our cuts by the aurora borealis." This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man cackled over it, and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, said I, surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all the poor people, or their spirits, will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will really be necessary?" "'Well, what else be they tombstones for? Answer me that, miss!' "'To please their relatives, I suppose.' "'To please their relatives, you suppose!' This he said with intense scorn. How will it please their relatives to know that lies is wrote over them, and that everybody in the place knows that they be lies?" He pointed to a stone at our feet, which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was rested close to the edge of the cliff. "'Read the lies on that thruff stone,' he said. The letters were upside down to me where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read, "'Sacred to the memory of George Cannon who died in the hope of a glorious resurrection, on July twenty ninth, eighteen seventy three, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely, and somewhat severely. You don't see aught funny. Ha <laughs> ha! But that's because you don't go on the sorrowin' mother was a hell-cat that hated him, because he was a screwed, a regular lamater he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide, in order that she mightn't get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that I had for scarin' crows with. Twarn't for crows then, for it brought the clegs and the dopes to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks. And as to hopes of a glorious resurrection. I've often heard him say myself that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. Now isn't that Steen at any rate?" He hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack o' lies! And won't it make Gabriel keckle when Geordie comes pantin' out the grease, with the top steam balanced on his hump, and asked to be took as evidence?" I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up. Oh, why did you tell us any of this? It is my favourite seat, and I cannot leave it, and now I find I must go on sitting over the grave of a suicide." "'That won't harm you, my pretty, and it may make poor Geordie gladsome to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt you. Why, I have sat here off and on for nigh twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't you fash about them as lies under you, or that doesn't lie there either. It'll be time for you to be getting scart when you see the tombsteens all run away with, and the place as bare as a stubble field. Ah, oh, there's the clock, and I must gang. My service to you, ladies." And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat, and she told me over all again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heart-sick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day. I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There is no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleating in the fields away behind me, and there is a clatter of donkeys' hoofs up the paved road below. The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time, and farther along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back street. Neither of the bands hears the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 June the case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some 
settled scheme of his own, but what it is I do not know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment, and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said, That would do. I must watch him. 18 June He has turned his mind now to spiders, and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside to his room. 1. July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must some of them, at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced in this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, bloated with some carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it exultantly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life, strong life, and gave life to him. This gave me an idea, or the rudiment of one. I must watch how he gets rid of his spiders. He has evidently some deep problem in his mind, for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting down something. Whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures, generally single numbers added up in batches, and then the totals added in batches again, as though he were focusing some account, as the auditors put it. 8 July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh, unconscious cerebration, you will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days, so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remained as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow, and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies, by tempting them with his food. 19 July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me, and said he wanted to ask me a great favor, a very, very great favor. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice, little, sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request, 
for I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size, in vivacity, but I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would not rather have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh, yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten, lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head, and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden fierce sidelong look which meant killing. The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving, and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again, and found him sitting in a corner, brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me, and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended on it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word, and sat down, gnawing his fingers, in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning, early. 20 July visited Rinfield very early before attendant went his rounds, found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with a good grace. I looked around for his birds, and, not seeing them, asked him where they were, he replied, without turning round, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there was anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to see me to say that Renfield has been very sick, and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds, and that he just took them, and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight, enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocket-book to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing about my brain lately is complete, and the theory is proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him, and call him a zoophagous, life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider, and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worth while to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind? Did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic? I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burden Sanderson's physiology, or Ferrier's brain knowledge, 
would be as nothing, if only there were a sufficient cause. I must not think too much of this, or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain, congenitally. How well the man reasoned! Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if at only one. He has closed the account most accurately, and to-day begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it shall be, until the great recorder sums me up, and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours. But I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If I could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good unselfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's Journal 26th July. I am anxious, and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to one's self and listening at the same time. And there is also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy, and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time, and was very concerned. But yesterday dear Mr. Hawkins, who is always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard, and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula, and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it, and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to her old habit of walking in her sleep. Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleep-walkers always go out on roofs of houses, and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened, or fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear! She is naturally anxious about Lucy, and tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, and that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning out her dresses, and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathise with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Holmwood, he is the Honourable Arthur Holmwood, only son of Lord Godalming, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up to the seat in the churchyard cliff, and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27th July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold. But still the anxiety in the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost the anaemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3rd August. Another week has gone by, and no news from Jonathan, not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written. 
I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him. And yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that." Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the last week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep she seems to be watching me. She tries the door, and finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6th August. Another three days, and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to, or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last week was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. To-day is a grey day, and the sun as I write is hidden in thick clouds, high over Kettleness. Everything is grey, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it, grey earthy rock, grey clouds, tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hang over the grey sea, into which the sand-points stretch like grey figures. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea-mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a grey mist. All vastness, the clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brool over the sea that sounds like some passage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home, and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbour, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, "'I want to say something to you, miss.' I could see he was not at his ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine, and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, "'I am afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I have been saying about the dead, and such like, for weeks past, but I didn't mean them and I want you to remember that when I'm gone. We old folks that be daffled, and with one foot abaft the crook-hole, don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scart of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But, Lord love you, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit, only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand, no, for I be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect." and I'm so nigh it that a yard man is already wet in his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of caffin' about it all at once. The chaffs will wag as they be used to. Some day soon the angel o' death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye do all and greet, me dearie?" For he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waitin' for something else than what we're doin', and death be all that we can rightly depend on but I am content, for it's comin' to me, my dearie, and comin' quick. It may be comin' while we be lookin' and wonderin'. Maybe it's in that wind out over the sea that's bringin' with it loss and wreck, and sore distress and sad hearts. Look! Look! he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind and in the house beyond that sounds, and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it comin'. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes! He held up his arms devoutly, and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes' silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me, and said good-bye, and hobbled off. It all touched me, and upset me very much. I was glad when the coast-guard came along, with his spy-glass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me, as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out," he said. She's a Russian by the look of her. But she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open, or to put in here. Look there again! She is steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel, changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time to-morrow. End of chapter 6 Dracula by Bram Stoker. 
Chapter Seven. Cutting from the Daily Graph, eight August, pasted in Mina Murray's journal. From a correspondent, Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather had been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the great body of holiday makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rigmill, Runswick, Staithes, and the various trips in the neighbourhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard, and from the commanding eminence watch the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree which in barometrical language is ranked number two, light breeze. The coast guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the east cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful, so grand in its masses of splendidly coloured clouds, that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its downward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset colour, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the R.A. and R.I. walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule, as they term the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbour till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers, which usually hugged the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing-boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner, with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment whilst she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in the face of her danger. Before the night shut down she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea. As idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before ten o'clock the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleating of a sheep inland, or the barking of a dog in the town, was distinctly heard, and the band on the pier, with its lively French air, was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which, at the time, seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realise, the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White-crested waves beat madly on the level sands, and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spumes swept the lanterns of the lighthouses which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbour. 
the wind roared like thunder, and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet, or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire pier from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea-fog came drifting inland. White, wet clouds, which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold, that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death, and many a one shuddered as the wreaths of sea-mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea for some distance could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which came thick and fast, followed by such peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high, threw skywards with each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing-boat, with a rag of sail, running madly for shelter before the blast, now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of on-rushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing-boat, with gunwale under water, rushed into the harbour, able, by the guidance of the sheltering light, to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on the shore, a shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale, and was then swept away in its rush. Before long the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff, as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and— with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbour. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that, in their troughs, the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner, with all sails set, was rushing with such speed that, in the words of one old salt, "'She must fetch up somewhere, if it was only in hell.' Then came another rush of sea-fog, greater than any hitherto, a mass of dank mist, which seemed to close on all things like a grey pall, and left available to men only the organ of hearing, for the roar of the tempest, and the crash of the thunder, and the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbour mouth across the east pier, where the shock was expected and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea-fog melted in the blast, and then, mirabile dictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast, with all sail set, and gained the safety of the harbour. The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse, with drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on the deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbour, unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but, rushing across the harbour, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier jutting under the east cliff, known locally as Tate Hill Pier. 
there was of course a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand-heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top-hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if shot up by the concussion, and, running forward, jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, where the churchyard hangs over the laneway to the east pier so steeply that some of the flat tombstones, thrustines or through-stones, as they call them in Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has fallen away. It disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus the coast guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbour, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb aboard. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbour without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The coast guard ran aft, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it, and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It is a good way round from the west cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, but your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck, and was one of a small group who saw the dead seamen whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised, or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel, and had dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffin, of 33 East Elliot Place, who came immediately after me, declared, after making examination, that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth. The fact that a Coast Guard was the first on board may save some complications later on, in the Admiralty Court, for Coast Guards cannot claim the salvage, which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict. Already, however, the legal tongues are wagging, and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed, his property being held in contravention of the statues of Mormaine, since the tiller, as emblemship, if not proof, of delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honourable watch and ward till death a steadfastness as noble as that of the young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. Crowds are scattering backward, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire wolds. I shall send, in time for your next issue, further details of the derelict ship, which found her way so miraculously into harbour in the storm. 9 August. The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the storm last night is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is Russian, from Varna, and is called the Demeter. 
she is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand, with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mould. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington, of Seven, the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and took formal possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship, and paid all harbour dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here to-day except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days wonder, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of other complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way on to the moors, where it is still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on it should in itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning a large dog, a half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant, close to Tate Hill Pier, was found dead in the roadway opposite its master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent, for its throat was torn away, and its belly was slit open, as if with a savage claw. Later. By the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the log-book of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest, except as to facts of missing men. The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was to-day produced at the inquest, and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold, it has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a transcript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he had got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken, cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. Log of the Demeter, Varna to Whitby. Written 18 July, things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6th July we finished taking in cargo, silver sand and boxes of earth. At noon set sail. East wind fresh. Crew, five hands. Two mates, cook, and myself, captain. On 11 July, at dawn, entered Bosphorus. Boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish! All correct. Underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July through Dardanelles. More customs officers and flag boat of guarding squadron. Bakshish again. Work of officers thorough but quick. Want us off soon. At dark passed into archipelago. On 13 July passed Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared, but would not speak out. On 14 July was somewhat anxious about crew. Men, all steady fellows who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something, and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch eight bells last night. Was relieved by Amramov, but did not go to bunk. Men more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate getting very impatient with them. Feared some trouble ahead. 
On 17 July, yesterday, one of the men, Olgerin, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deckhouse as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man who was not like any of the crew come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to the bows found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I'm afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search the entire ship carefully, from stem to stern. Later in the day I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First mate angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men, said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with the handspike. I let him take the helm, while the rest began a thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. As there were only big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when search over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22 July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands busy with sails, no time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. 24 July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short and entering the Bay of Biscay with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men all in a panic of fear sent a round robin, asking to have double watch as they fear to be alone. Mate angry. Fear there will be some trouble as either he or the men will do some violence. 28 July. Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom, and the wind a tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all worn out. Hardly know how to set a watch, since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch, and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating, seas still terrific, but feel them less, as ship is steadier. 29 July. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersmen. Raised outcry and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth and wait for any sign of cause. 30 July, last night. Rejoiced we are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired worn out, slept soundly, awakened by mate telling me that both man of watch and steersman missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. 1 August. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently with minds made up to worst. They are Russian, he Romanian. 2 August, Midnight Woke up from few minutes' sleep by hearing a cry seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover, as in a moment of fog lifting he saw North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog. 
which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3 August. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night I saw it, like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air. And as he spoke he took the knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on. But it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hole perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and lantern and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark, raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are invoiced as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay and mind the helm and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then, if I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down sails and lie by and signal for help. It is nearly over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him, there came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream which made my blood run cold, and up the deck he came, as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. "'Save me! Save me!' he cried, and then looked around on the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, "'You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. "'He's there. I know the secret now. "'The sea will save me from him, and it's all that is left.' "'Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, "'he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. "'I suppose I know the secret too now. "'It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me! How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, will that ever be? 4 August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I'm a sailor. Why else I know not? I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm, so here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it. Him. God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man. To die like a sailor in blue water, no man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honor as captain. I am growing weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found and those who find it may understand. If not, well then all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders there is now none to say. The folk here hold almost universally that the captain is simply a hero, and he is to be given a public funeral. 
Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece, and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for, with public opinion in its present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. To-morrow we'll see the funeral, and so we'll end this one more Mystery of the Sea. Mina Murray's Journal 8th August Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney-pots it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her, and got her back in bed. It is a very strange thing this sleep-walking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning we both got up and went down to the harbour, to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air clear and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow, forced themselves in through the mouth of the harbour, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow I felt glad that Jonathan was not in the sea last night, but on land. But, oh, is he on land or sea? Where is he, and how? I am getting fearfully anxious about him. If I only knew what to do, and could do anything! 10th August. The funeral of the poor sea-captain to-day was most touching. Every boat in the harbour seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat, whilst the cortege of boats went up the river to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view, and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest near our seat, so that we stood on it, when the time came, and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that poor Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck being broken. He had, evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man! Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I myself am very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry, nor heard the dog bark. During the service the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently and then harshly, and then angrily. But it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a fury, with its eyes savage, and all its hair bristling out like a cat's tail when puss is on the war-path. Finally the man too got angry, and jumped down and kicked the dog, and then took it by the scruff of the neck, and half dragged and half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing began to tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down, quivering and cowering, and was in such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effect, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity, too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in an agonized sort of way. I greatly fear that she is of too supersensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this to-night, I am sure. The whole agglomeration of things— the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude, 
tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog, now furious and now in terror, will all afford material for her dreams. I think it would be best for her to go to bed tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin's Hood Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleep-walking then. End of chapter 7 Dracula by Bram Stoker Chapter 8 Mina Murray's Journal Same day, eleven o'clock p.m. Oh, but I am tired! If it were not that I had made my diary a duty, I should not open it to-night. We had a lovely walk. Lucy, after a while, was in gay spirits, owing, I think, to some dear cows who came nosing towards us in a field close to the lighthouse, and frightened the wits out of us. I believe we forgot everything, except, of course, personal fear, and it seemed to wipe the slate clean and give us a fresh start. We had a capital, severe tea at Robin's Hood Bay, in a sweet little old-fashioned inn, with a bow-window right over the seaweed-covered rocks of the Strand. I believe we should have shocked the new woman with our appetites. Men are more tolerant, bless them. Then we walked home with some, or rather many, stoppages to rest, and with our hearts full of a constant dread of wild bulls. Lucy was really tired, and we intended to creep off to bed as soon as we could. The young curate came in, however, and Mrs. Westenra asked him to stay for supper. Lucy and I had both a fight for it with the dusty miller. I know it was a hard fight on my part, and I am quite heroic. I think that some day the bishops must get together and see about breeding up a new class of curates, who don't take supper, no matter how hard they may be pressed to, and who will know when girls are tired. Lucy is asleep and breathing softly. She has more colour in her cheeks than usual, and looks, oh, so sweet! If Mr. Holmwood fell in love with her, seeing her only in the drawing-room, I wonder what he would say if he saw her now. Some of the new women writers will some day start an idea that men and women should be allowed to see each other asleep before proposing and accepting. But I suppose the new woman won't condescend in future to accept. She will do the proposing herself and a nice job she will make of it, too. There's some consolation in that. I am so happy to-night, because dear Lucy seems better. I really believe she has turned the corner, and that we are over her troubles with dreaming. I should be quite happy if I only knew if Jonathan—God bless and keep him. 11th August. Diary again. No sleep now, so I may as well write. I am too agitated to sleep. We have had such an adventure, such an agonizing experience. I fell asleep as soon as I had closed my diary. Suddenly I became broad awake and sat up, with a horrible sense of fear upon me, and of some feeling of emptiness around me. The room was dark, so I could not see Lucy's bed. I stole across and felt for her. The bed was empty. I lit a match and found that she was not in the room. The door was shut, but not locked, as I had left it. I feared to wake her mother, who has been more than usually ill lately, so threw on some clothes and got ready to look for her. As I was leaving the room it struck me that the clothes she wore might give me some clue as to her dreaming intention. Dressing-gown would mean house, dress outside. Dressing-gown and dress were both in their places. Thank God, I said to myself, she cannot be far as she is only in her night-dress. I ran downstairs and looked in the sitting-room. Not there. Then I looked in all the other rooms of the house, with an ever-growing fear chilling my heart. Finally I came to the hall door and found it open. It was not wide open, but the catch of the lock had not caught. The people of the house are careful to lock the door every night, so I feared that Lucy must have gone out as she was. There was no time to think of what might happen. A vague, overmastering fear obscured all details. I took a big, heavy shawl and ran out. The clock was striking one as I was in the crescent, and there was not a soul in sight. I ran along the north terrace, but could see no sign of the white figure I expected. At the edge of the west cliff above the pier I looked across the harbour to the east cliff, in the hope, or fear, I don't know which, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. There was a bright full moon, with heavy, black, driving clouds, which threw the whole scene into a fleeting diorama of light and shade as they sailed across. 
For a moment or two I could see nothing, as the shadow of a cloud obscured St. Mary's Church and all around it. Then, as the cloud passed, I could see the ruins of the abbey coming into view, and as the edge of a narrow band of light as sharp as a sword-cut moved along, the church and churchyard became gradually visible. Whatever my expectation was, it was not disappointed, for there, on our favourite seat, the silver light of the moon struck a half-reclining figure, snowy white. The coming of the cloud was too quick for me to see much, for shadow shut down on light almost immediately, but it seemed to me as though something dark stood behind the seat where the white figure shone, and bent over it. What it was, whether man or beast, I could not tell. I did not wait to catch another glance, but flew down the steep steps to the pier and along by the fish-market to the bridge, which was the only way to reach the east cliff. The town seemed as dead, for not a soul did I see. I rejoiced that it was so, for I wanted no witness of poor Lucy's condition. The time and distance seemed endless, and my knees trembled and my breath came laboured as I toiled up the endless steps to the abbey. I must have gone fast, and yet it seemed to me as if my feet were weighted with lead, and as though every joint in my body were rusty. When I got almost to the top I could see the seat and the white figure, for I was now close enough to distinguish it even through the spells of shadow. There was undoubtedly something, long and black, bending over the half-reclining white figure. I called in fright, "'Lucy! Lucy!' and something raised a head, and from where I was I could see a white face and red, gleaming eyes. Lucy did not answer, and I ran on to the entrance of the churchyard. As I entered the church was between me and the seat, and for a minute or so I lost sight of her. When I came in view again the cloud had passed, and the moonlight struck so brilliantly that I could see Lucy half reclining with her head lying over the back of the seat. She was quite alone, and there was not a sign of any living thing about. When I bent over her, I could see that she was still asleep. Her lips were parted, and she was breathing, not softly as usual with her, but in long, heavy gasps, as though striving to get her lungs full at every breath. As I came close, she put up her hand in her sleep, and pulled the collar of her nightdress close around her, as though she felt the cold. I flung the warm shawl over her, and drew the edges tight round her neck, for I dreaded lest she should get some deadly chill from the night air, unclad as she was. I feared to wake her all at once, so in order to have my hands free to help her, I fastened the shawl at her throat with a big safety-pin. But I must have been clumsy in my anxiety and pinched or pricked her with it, for by and by, when her breathing became quieter, she put her hand to her throat again and moaned. When I had her carefully wrapped up, I put my shoes on her feet, and then began very gently to wake her. At first she did not respond, but gradually she became more and more uneasy in her sleep, moaning and sighing occasionally. At last, as time was passing fast, and for many other reasons, I wished to get her home at once, I shook her forcibly, till finally she opened her eyes and awoke. She did not seem surprised to see me, as of course she did not realise all at once where she was. Lucy always wakes prettily, and even at such a time, when her body must have been chilled with cold, and her mind somewhat appalled at waking unclad in a churchyard at night, she did not lose her grace. She trembled a little, and clung to me. When I told her to come at once with me home, she rose without a word, with the obedience of a child. As we passed along, the gravel hurt my feet, and Lucy noticed me wince. She stopped and wanted to insist upon my taking my shoes, but I would not. However, when we got to the pathway outside the churchyard, where there was a puddle of water remaining from the storm, I dawed my feet with mud, using each foot in turn on the other, so that, as we went home, no one, in case we should meet any one, should notice my bare feet. Fortune favoured us, and we got home without meeting a soul. Once we saw a man, who seemed not quite sober, passing along a street in front of us. But we hid in a door till he had disappeared up an opening such as there are here, steep little closes, or winds, as they call them in Scotland. My heart beat so loud all the time sometimes I thought I should faint. I was filled with anxiety about Lucy, not only for her health, lest she should suffer from the exposure, but for her reputation in case the story should get wind. When we got in and washed our feet, and had said a prayer of thankfulness together, I tucked her into bed. Before falling asleep, she asked, even implored me not to say a word to any one, even her mother, about her sleep-walking adventure. I hesitated at first to promise, 
but on thinking of the state of her mother's health, and how the knowledge of such a thing would fret her, and think, too, of how such a story might become distorted, nay, infallibly would, in case it should leak out, I thought it wiser to do so. I hope I did right. I have locked the door, and the key is tied to my wrist, so perhaps I shall not be again disturbed. Lucy is sleeping soundly. The reflex of the dawn is high and far over the sea. Same day, noon. All goes well. Lucy slept till I woke her, and seemed not to have even changed her side. The adventure of the night does not seem to have harmed her. On the contrary, it has benefited her, for she looks better this morning than she has done for weeks. I was sorry to notice that my clumsiness with the safety-pin hurt her. Indeed it might have been serious, for the skin of her throat was pierced. I must have pinched up a piece of loose skin and have transfixed it, for there are two little red points like pin-pricks, and on the band of her night-dress was a drop of blood. When I apologized and was concerned about it, she laughed and petted me, and said she did not even feel it. Fortunately it could not leave a scar, as it is so tiny. Same day, night. We passed a happy day. The air was clear and the sun bright, and there was a cool breeze. We took our lunch to Mulgrave Woods, Mrs. Westenra driving by the road, and Lucy and I walking by the cliff-path and joining her at the gate. I felt a little sad myself, for I could not but feel how absolutely happy it would have been had Jonathan been with me. But there, I must only be patient. In the evening we strolled in the casino terrace, and heard some good music by Spore and Mackenzie, and went to bed early. Lucy seems more restful than she has been for some time, and fell asleep at once. I shall lock the door and secure the key the same as before, though I do not expect any trouble to-night. 12th August. My expectations were wrong, for twice during the night I was wakened by Lucy trying to get out. She seemed, even in her sleep, to be a little impatient at finding the door shut, and went back to bed under a sort of protest. I woke at the dawn and heard the birds chirping out of the window. Lucy woke, too, and I was glad to see was even better than on the previous morning. All her old gaiety of manner seemed to have come back, and she came and snuggled in beside me and told me all about Arthur. I told her how anxious I was about Jonathan, and then she tried to comfort me. Well, she succeeded somewhat, for though sympathy can't alter facts, it can make them more bearable. 13th August. Another quiet day and to bed with the key on my wrist as before. Again I woke in the night and found Lucy sitting up in bed, still asleep, pointing to the window. I got up quietly, and pulling aside the blind, looked out. It was a brilliant moonlight, and the soft effect of the light over the sea and sky, merged together in one great silent mystery, was beautiful beyond words. Between me and the moonlight flitted a great bat, coming and going in great whirling circles. Once or twice it came quite close, but was, I suppose, frightened at seeing me, and flitted away across the harbour towards the abbey. When I came back from the window Lucy had lain down again, and was sleeping peacefully. She did not stir again all night. 14th August. On the East Cliff, reading and writing all day. Lucy seems to have become as much in love with the spot as I am and it is hard to get her away from it when it is time to come home for lunch or tea or dinner. This afternoon she made a funny remark. We were coming home for dinner, and had come to the top of the steps up from the west pier and stopped to look at the view as we generally do. The setting sun, low down in the sky, was just dropping behind Kettle Ness. The red light was thrown over the east cliff and the old abbey, and seemed to bathe everything in a beautiful rosy glow. We were silent for a while, and suddenly, Lucy murmured as if to herself, "'His red eyes again! They are just the same!' It was such an odd expression, coming apropos of nothing, that it quite startled me. I slowed round a little as to see Lucy well without seeming to stare at her, and saw that she was in a half-dreamy state, with an odd look on her face that I could not quite make out, so I said nothing but followed her eyes. She appeared to be looking over at our own seat whereon was a dark figure seated alone. I was quite a little startled myself, for it seemed for an instant as if the stranger had great eyes like burning flames. But a second look dispelled the illusion. The red sunlight was shining on the windows of St. Mary's Church behind our seat, 
and as the sun dipped there was just sufficient change in the reflection and refraction to make it appear as if the light moved. I called Lucy's attention to the peculiar effect, and she became herself with a start, but she looked sad all the same. It may have been that she was thinking of that terrible night up there. We never refer to it, so I said nothing and we went home to dinner. Lucy had a headache, and went early to bed. I saw her asleep, and went out for a little stroll myself. I walked along the cliffs to the westward, and was full of sweet sadness, for I was thinking of Jonathan. When coming home it was then bright moonlight, so bright that, though the front of our part of the crescent was in shadow, everything could be well seen. I threw a glance up at our window, and saw Lucy's head leaning out. I opened my handkerchief and waved it. She did not notice or make any movement whatever. Just then the moonlight crept round an angle of the building, and the light fell on the window. There distinctly was Lucy with her head lying up against the side of the window-sill, and her eyes shut. She was fast asleep, and by her, seated on the window-sill, was something that looked like a good-sized bird. I was afraid she might get a chill, so I ran upstairs, but as I came into the room she was moving back to her bed, fast asleep, and breathing heavily. She was holding her hand to her throat, as though to protect it from the cold. I did not wake her, but tucked her up warmly. I have taken care that the door is locked and the window securely fastened. She looks so sweet as she sleeps, but she is paler than is her wont, and there is a drawn, haggard look under her eyes which I do not like. I fear she is fretting about something. I wish I could find out what it is. 15th August. Rose later than usual. Lucy was languid and tired, and slept on after we had been called. We had a happy surprise at breakfast. Arthur's father is better, and wants the marriage to come off soon. Lucy is full of quiet joy, and her mother is glad and sorry at once. Later on in the day she told me the cause. She is grieved to lose Lucy as her very own, but is rejoiced that she is soon to have some one to protect her. Poor dear sweet lady! She confided to me that she has got her death warrant. She has not told Lucy, and has made me promise secrecy. Her doctor told her that within a few months, at most, she must die, for her heart is weakening. At any time, even now, a sudden shock would be almost sure to kill her. Ah, oh, we were wise to keep from her the affair of the dreadful night of Lucy's sleep-walking. 17th August. No diary for two whole days. I have not had the heart to write. Some sort of shadowy pall seems to be coming over our happiness. No news from Jonathan, and Lucy seems to be growing weaker, whilst her mother's hours are numbering to a close. I do not understand Lucy's fading away as she is doing. She eats well and sleeps well, and enjoys the fresh air. But all the time the roses in her cheeks are fading, and she gets weaker and more languid day by day. At night I hear her gasping as if for air. I keep the key of our door always fastened to my wrist at night, but she gets up and walks about the room, and sits at the open window. Last night I found her leaning out when I woke up, and when I tried to wake her, I could not. She was in a faint. When I managed to restore her, she was as weak as water, and cried silently between long, painful struggles for breath. When I asked her how she came to be at the window, she shook her head and turned away. I trust her feeling ill may not be from that unlucky prick of the safety-pin. I looked at her throat just now as she lay asleep, and the tiny wounds seem not to have healed. They are still open, and if anything larger than before, and the edges of them are faintly white. They are like little white dots with red centres. Unless they heal within a day or two, I shall insist on the doctor seeing about them. Letter Samuel F. Billington and Son Solicitors Whitby to Messrs. Carter, Patterson & Co., London. 17th of August. Dear Sirs, Herewith please receive invoice of goods sent by Great Northern Railway. Same are to be delivered at Carfax, near Purfleet, immediately on receipt at goods station King's Cross. The house is at present empty, but enclosed please find keys, all of which are labelled. You will please deposit the boxes, fifty in number, which form the consignment, in the partially ruined building forming part of the house, and marked A on rough diagrams enclosed. Your agent will easily recognise the locality, as it is the ancient chapel of the mansion. 
The goods leave by the train at 9.30 tonight, and will be due at King's Cross at 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. As our client wishes the delivery made as soon as possible, we shall be obliged by your having teams ready at King's Cross, at the time named, and forthwith conveying the goods to destination. In order to obviate any delays possible, through any routine requirements as to payment in your departments, we enclose cheque herewith for ten pounds, receipt of which please acknowledge. Should the charge be less than this amount, you can return balance. If greater, we shall at once send cheque for difference on hearing from you. You are to leave the keys on coming away in the main hall of the house, where the proprietor may get them on his entering the house by means of his duplicate key. Pray, do not take us as exceeding the bounds of business, courtesy, and pressing you in all ways to use the utmost expedition. We are, dear sirs, faithfully yours, Samuel F. Billington and Son. Letter, Mr. Carter, Patterson and Company, London, to Mr. Billington and Son, Whitby. 21. August Dear Sirs, we beg to acknowledge ten pounds received and to return cheque of one pound seventeen s nine d amount of overplus as shown in receipted accounts herewith goods are delivered in exact accordance with instructions and keys left in parcel in main hall as directed we are dear sirs yours respectfully pro carter patterson and company mina murray's journal 18th August. I am happy to-day, and right sitting on the seat in the churchyard. Lucy is ever so much better. Last night she slept well all night, and did not disturb me once. The roses seem coming back already to her cheeks, though she is still sadly pale and wan-looking. If she were in any way anemic I could understand it, but she is not. She is in gay spirits, and full of life and cheerfulness. All the morbid reticence seems to have passed from her, and she has just reminded me, as if I needed any reminding, of that night, and that it was here on this very seat I found her asleep. As she told me, she tapped playfully with the heel of her boot on the stone slab, and said, "'My poor little feet didn't make much noise then. I dare say poor old Mr. Swales would have told me that it was because I didn't want to wake up Geordie.' As she was in such a communicative humour, I asked her if she had dreamt at all that night. Before she answered, that sweet, puckered look came into her forehead, which Arthur—I call him Arthur from a habit—says he loves, and indeed I don't wonder that he does. Then she went on in a half-dreaming kind of way, as if trying to recall it to herself. I didn't quite dream, but it all seemed to be real. I only wanted to be here in this spot. I don't know why, for I was afraid of something, I don't know what. I remember, though I suppose I was asleep, passing through the streets and over the bridge. A fish leapt as I went by, and I leaned over to look at it, and I heard a lot of dogs howling. The whole town seemed as if it must be full of dogs, all howling at once as I went up the steps. Then I had a vague memory of something long and dark with red eyes, just as we saw in the sunset, and something very sweet and very bitter all around me at once. And then I seemed sinking into deep green water, and there was a singing in my ears as I have heard there is to drowning men, and then everything seemed passing away from me. My soul seemed to go out from my body, and float about the air. I seemed to remember that once the West Lighthouse was right under me, and then there was a sort of agonizing feeling, as if I were in an earthquake, and I came back and found you shaking my body. I saw you do it before I felt you." Then she began to laugh. It seemed a little uncanny to me, and I listened to her breathlessly. I did not quite like it, and thought it better not to keep her mind on the subject. So we drifted on to another subject, and Lucy was like her old self again. When we got home the fresh breeze had braced her up, and her pale cheeks were really more rosy. Her mother rejoiced when she saw her, and we all spent a very happy evening together. 19th August. Joy! 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 Although not all joy. At last news of Jonathan! The dear fellow has been ill, that is why he did not write. I am not afraid to think it, or to say it, now that I know. Mr. Hawkins sent me on the letter, and wrote himself, oh, so kindly. I am to leave in the morning and go over to Jonathan, and to help to nurse him, if necessary, and to bring him home. Mr. Hawkins says it would not be a bad thing if we were to be married out there. I have cried over the good sister's letter till I can feel it wet against my bosom where it lies. 
It is of Jonathan, and must be near my heart, for he is in my heart. My journey is all mapped out, and my luggage ready. I am only taking one change of dress. Lucy will bring my trunk to London and keep it till I send for it, for it may be that—I must write no more. I must keep it to say to Jonathan, my husband. The letter that he has seen and touched must comfort me till we meet. Letter Sister Agatha, Hospital of St. Joseph and St. Mary, Budapest, to Miss Wilhelmina Murray. 12th of August. Dear Madam, I write by desire of Mr. Jonathan Harker, who is himself not strong enough to write, though progressing well, thanks to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary. He has been under our care for nearly six weeks, suffering from a violent brain fever. He wishes me to convey his love, and to say that by this post I write for him to Mr. Peter Hawkins, Exeter, to say, with his dutiful respects, that he is sorry for his delay, and that all of his work is completed. He will require some few weeks' rest in our sanatorium in the hills, but will then return. He wishes me to say that he has not sufficient money with him, and that he would like to pay for his staying here, so that others who need shall not be wanting for help. Believe me, yours with sympathy and all blessings, Sister Agatha. P.S. My patient being asleep, I open this to let you know something more. He has told me all about you, and that you are shortly to be his wife. All blessings to you both. He has had some fearful shock, so says our doctor, and in his delirium his ravings have been dreadful, of wolves and poison and blood, of ghosts and demons, and I fear to say of what. Be careful of him always, that there may be nothing to excite him of this kind for a long time to come. The traces of such an illness as his do not lightly die away. We should have written long ago, but we knew nothing of his friends, and there was nothing on him, nothing that any one could understand. He came in the train from Klausenberg, and the guard was told by the station-master there that he rushed into the station shouting for a ticket for home. Seeing from his violent demeanour that he was English, they gave him a ticket for the furthest station on the way thither that the train reached. Be assured that he is well cared for. He has won all hearts by his sweetness and gentleness. He is truly getting on well, and I have no doubt will in a few weeks be all himself. But be careful of him for safety's sake. There are, I pray to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary, many, many happy years for you both. Dr. Seward's Diary 19 August Strange and sudden change in Renfield last night. About eight o'clock he began to get excited and sniff about as a dog does when setting. The attendant was struck by his manner, and, knowing my interest in him, encouraged him to talk. He is usually respectful to the attendant, and at times servile, but tonight, the man tells me, he was quite haughty, would not condescend to talk with him at all. All he would say was, I don't want to talk to you. You don't count now. The master is at hand. The attendant thinks it is some sudden form of religious mania which has seized him. If so, we must look out for squalls, for a strong man, with homicidal and religious mania, at once might be dangerous. The combination is a dreadful one. At nine o'clock I visited him myself. His attitude to me was the same as that to the attendant. In his sublime self-feeling, the difference between myself and the attendant seemed to him as nothing. It looks like religious mania, and he will soon think that he himself is God. These infinitesimal distinctions between man and man are too paltry for an omnipotent being. How these madmen give themselves away! The real God taketh heed lest a sparrow fall. 
but the god created from human vanity sees no difference between an eagle and a sparrow oh if men only knew for half an hour or more renfield kept getting excited in greater and greater degree i did not pretend to be watching him but i kept strict observation all the same all at once that shifty look came into his eyes which we always see when a madman has seized an idea and with it the shifty movement of the head and back which asylum attendants come to know so well he became quite quiet and went and sat on the edge of his bed resignedly and looked into space with lack-lustre eyes i thought i would find out if his apathy were real or only assumed and tried to lead him to talk of his pets a theme which had never failed to excite his attention at first he made no reply but at length said testily bother them all i don't care a pen about them what i said you don't mean to tell me you don't care about spiders spiders at present are his hobby and his notebook is filling up with columns of small figures to this he answered enigmatically the bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride but when the bride draweth nigh then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled he would not explain himself but remained obstinately seated on his bed all the time i remained with him i am weary to-night and low in spirits i cannot but think of lucy and how different things might have been if i don't sleep at once chloral the modern morpheus i must be careful not to let it grow into a habit no i shall take none to-night i have thought of lucy and i shall not dishonour her by mixing the two if need be to-night shall be sleepless later glad i made the resolution gladder that i kept to it i had lain tossing about and had heard the clock strike only twice when the night watchman came to me sent up from the ward to say that renfield had escaped i threw on my clothes and ran down at once my patient is too dangerous a person to be roaming about those ideas of his might work out dangerously with strangers the attendant was waiting for me he said he had seen him not ten minutes before seemingly asleep in his bed when he looked through the observation trap in the door his attention was called by the sound of the window being wrenched out he ran back and saw his feet disappear through the window and had at once sent up for me he was only in his night-gear and cannot be far off the attendant thought it would be more useful to watch where he should go than to follow him as he might lose sight of him whilst getting out of the building by the door he is a bulky man and couldn't get through the window i am thin so with his aid i got out but feet foremost and as we were only a few feet above ground landed unhurt the attendant told me the patient had gone to the left and had taken a straight line so i ran as quickly as i could as i got through the belt of trees i saw a white figure scale the high wall which separates our grounds from those of the deserted house i ran back at once told the watchman to get three or four
four men immediately and follow me into the grounds of Carfax, in case our friend might be dangerous. I got a ladder myself, and crossing the wall, dropped down on the other side. I could see Renfield's figure just disappearing behind the angle of the house, so I ran after him. On the far side of the house I found him pressed close against the old iron-bound oak door of the chapel. He was talking, apparently, to someone, but I was afraid to go near enough to hear what he was saying, lest I might frighten him, and he should run off. Chasing an errant swarm of bees is nothing to following a naked lunatic, when the fit of escaping is upon him. After a few minutes, however, I could see that he did not take note of anything around him, and so ventured to draw nearer to him, the more so as my men had now crossed the wall and were closing him in. I heard him say, I'm here to do your bidding, master. I am your slave, and you will reward me, for I shall be faithful. I have worshipped you long and afar off. Now that you are near, I await your commands, and you will not pass me by, will you, dear master, in your distribution of good things? He is a selfish old beggar, anyhow. He thinks of the loaves and fishes, even when he believes he is in a real presence. His manias make a startling combination. When we closed in on him, he fought like a tiger. He is immensely strong, for he was more like a wild beast than a man. I never saw a lunatic in such a paroxysm of rage before, and I hope I shall not again. It is a mercy that we have found out his strength and his danger in good time. With strength and determination like his, he might have done wild work before he was caged. He is safe now, at any rate. Jack Shepherd himself couldn't get free from the straight waistcoat that keeps him restrained, and he's chained to the wall in the padded room. His cries are, at times, awful, but the silences that follow are more deadly still, for he means murder in every turn and movement. Just now he spoke coherent words for the first time. I shall be patient, master. It is coming, coming, coming. So I took the hint, and came to. I was too excited to sleep, but this diary has quieted me, and I feel I shall get some sleep tonight. End of chapter 8